the stare down on Russia's border with Ukraine. The story gets the Cold War treatment and needs an update. Election season is coming in France. The president and one of his challengers have messages for the media. Greece, the growing issue of femicide, and the patriarchal problem news outlets need to get past. Plus, how a problematic tennis player has put the spotlight on Australia's mistreatment of refugees. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post, where we dig into the coverage and look at how news is reported. War has been described as politics by other means. Russia has been preparing for one of those things while practicing the other. With nearly 100,000 Russian troops perched on the border with Ukraine, its diplomats met with officials from the U.S. and NATO. They're out to prevent Ukraine from joining the Western Military Alliance. The prospect of another Russian invasion of the former Soviet state along the lines of the one in 2014 is very real, with both Moscow and Washington drawing lines in the sand on NATO's expansion to the east. President Vladimir Putin has long claimed that historically Ukraine is part of Russia. He has allies on the Russian airwaves echoing that position. Western media coverage tends to default to language that's reminiscent of the Cold War, when states like Ukraine were Soviet republics caught in the middle, their futures decided in places like Washington and Moscow. Our starting point this week is the border that lies between Russia and Ukraine. 100,000 Russian troops amassed on or near the border with Ukraine. Moscow and Washington both sticking to their positions in negotiations over NATO expanding to the east. Out of the West, headlines reminding us the stakes are high. And Russia's state-approved media, if not beating, at least tapping, the drums of war. On the surface, it all sounds very 2014, when Russian forces invaded Ukraine and annexed Crimea. Only a lot of things have changed since then. Absolutely, you don't have the sort of war frenzy vibe that you did in 2014 when the, the state TV hosts are really frothing at the mouth for, over Ukraine. And there are a few reasons for that. Firstly, the, the magic Crimea dust uh, that worked so well for Putin that sent his uh, approval ratings to record levels for a time, it's, it's really worn off because it's, the circumstances have changed. There's much more of a focus on uh, rising inflation, falling incomes, and the pandemic. This whole mess around Ukraine and around Ukraine's uh, so-called integration to NATO uh, is, uh, in my opinion, connected to Vladimir Putin's internal popularity and his ratings, which are not very good. And uh, it's funny how Russian state media covers the situation, because to them, and the main goal is to cover anything except internal problems anything except the violation of human rights or killing the free press. It's going back to their old playbook. It happened in 2008 with Georgia, right? And when you look at anything bad happening in Russia, whether it be its economy, whether it could be a wide range of things, the best thing to do is to ratchet up nationalist thought. And so if he can drum up rhetoric that will drive support for him in that regard, Putin will do it. If it's not broke, um, you know, why not continue to use it? The Russian president signaled his intentions on Ukraine last July, and not by conventional means. Rather than issuing a press release or holding a news conference, the Kremlin posted a 5,000-word essay that it said was written by Vladimir Putin himself on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians. That essay was posted in three languages, aimed at three audiences, Russian, Ukrainian, and English speakers. Um, Putin's essay did was a history lesson about what he says was Ukrainian and Russian unity. But in reality, it, it was an essay of disinformation. Putin's language for unity is basically we were united because we colonized you and because we subjected you to our power. It had nothing to do with their liberty and their choice. Throughout the centuries in which Kiev and Moscow has had a relationship, it's been one of Russia is here and in, in Kiev, in Kiev is there. 
And President Putin himself, in his essay last summer, he wrote that Ukrainians and Russians are one people. So the, the Russian position is that uh, basically denial of Ukraine sovereignty. We, Russia, and Ukraine are part of Russia, and you will be convinced of it soon. This idea was floated by several Russian high-ranking politicians with, uh, on Russian state television. They actually say, well, Ukraine, there is no such country, and it's just like a historical mistake that should be corrected. The Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, is a former comedian whose response to Putin's essay came laced with sarcasm. Просто думаю, що ми постійно говоримо про нашу зустріч і, і на зустріч між президентами України і Російської Федерації зараз щось не вистачає часу у президента Росії. Я просто не знав, на що він витрачає цей час, і зараз я бачу результат. Зеленський made his name playing a fictitious Ukrainian president on television before getting elected to the real job in 2019. Under Zelensky, Kiev has taken a hands-on approach to the news media. It cannot stop Russian news channels like RT from beaming into the country. But early last year, it took three Ukrainian news channels off the airwaves. 112 Ukraine, News One, and Zik were all linked to the same pro-Russian oligarch, Viktor Medvedchuk, a Ukrainian. So I, I understand when you have a war, with the country, you can't have uh, the you know the propaganda machine of that country in in your home. Still, I think it was a mistake. This decision of Zelensky. I'm against any kind of shutdowns anywhere. I'm against shutting down RT in Europe, in spite of the fact that they are propaganda machine. This is not a democracy. This is not a European way of development. This is how the freedom of speech works. Well, uh, I tend to disagree with this assessment because Ukraine is probably one of the countries of the world that is most heavily targeted by uh, disinformation and propaganda, uh, a part of Russian so-called hybrid war against Ukraine. So uh, along with military tactics, Russia uses disinformation to weaken Ukraine's resilience and to weaken Ukraine's uh, um, uh, support in the West. Zelensky's government was conspicuously absent from this week's talks on Ukraine's future, and not by choice. First, the Russians met with the Americans in Geneva, then with NATO in Brussels. As a former Soviet Republic, Ukraine is accustomed to having its fate determined in distant capitals. This week's talks would have felt all too familiar. This is a 21st century story with a 20th century Cold War context that shapes the coverage and the terminology from the headlines on down. And that does the Ukrainian people no favors. Let's think about the key negotiators. You have Joe Biden and you have Vladimir Putin. They are babies of the Cold War. So it makes sense for them to look at this political framework through that lens. So it's not completely wrong. You have reporters who lazily refer to that because that's something that a lot of Americans can relate to, right? When you look at TV, viewership, a lot of them are not millennial, right? And so you're gonna use references that people can relate to, even though in many cases, it decontextualizes what the contemporary issues are. So basically the challenge is how do you move beyond that? It takes a it, it takes an intellectual and a political paradigm shift. Well, I think this is how Russia wants to present it. And Russian rhetoric and Russian actions, they are aimed to frame all the debates around Ukraine in the context of a geopolitical struggle between the great powers. And that's actually worrying that the talks this week are held without Ukraine's presence. And that was Russia's goal to exclude Ukraine. And the fact that the whole situation is sometimes portrayed in the media in terms of, of the struggle of big powers in this Cold War optics plays into the hands of Russia because that's how uh, Moscow would like to see it. As for how this conflict will play out, one does not have to go back centuries, as Vladimir Putin would suggest, to see what may be coming. Or even back to the 1990s, when the Soviet Union fell apart. There's some more recent history made in 2008, 
another conflict between Russia and one of its former republics that provides a model that the Kremlin and its essayist in chief probably have in mind. One thing you hear people mention a lot in, in Russia is the, the Georgian War in 2008, which was only four days long, but it was, it was sufficient to essentially end uh, Georgia's Euro-Atlantic aspirations. And what happened in Georgia after the war is very much what Russia would like to see happen in Ukraine, some sort of uh, limited uh, military campaign that takes out Ukraine's uh, military capabilities, creates new facts on the ground, forces Ukraine to make more concessions. So ultimately, just like in Georgia, you have some sort of uh, uh, acceptable, Russia-friendly oligarch. France is on our radar this week. Elections there are just three months away, and two candidates for the presidency began the year speaking to the media about the media. Tarek Nafa has been following the story. Thanks, Richard. This past week, President Emmanuel Macron set out how he intends to stop the spread of disinformation and conspiracy theories in France. He pledged to hold online platforms and influencers accountable in the same way that journalists are. Son responsable croise les sources et peuvent répondre d'ailleurs de ce qu'ils écrivent devant le juge. Il doit en être de même pour toutes celles et ceux qui produisent et diffusent l'information. Macron's comments came off the back of a government commission study into how to deal with online propaganda. The recommendations included teaching children how to question what they see on social media, as well as suggestions on how to discipline those who spread fake news. Macron also talked about the role of the mainstream media in debunking disinformation. Sans presse, sans le travail de vérification des informations et les fausses informations donc auraient été plus puissantes et plus dangereuses encore. Some might question the sincerity of those complimentary remarks given Macron's fractious relationship with the media. The French president has only held two press conferences during the pandemic. He prefers to deliver speeches from behind a desk where he can go unchallenged. One man challenging Macron for the presidency, former journalist and pundit Eric Zemmour, also has a pretty dim view of the media. This week, Zemmour berated his former colleagues, describing them as the most hated people in the country. Je vous souhaite de chercher la vérité, de la trouver, de la dire. Je vous souhaite de vous libérer de vos œillères idéologiques, de penser enfin entièrement par vous-même, sans céder à la pression lancinante du conformisme. Je vous souhaite d'exercer le métier le plus excitant du monde. Je vous souhaite d'être journaliste. Eric Zemmour there, a man who made his name peddling racist and toxic ideas, offering advice to reporters. He also claims his election would somehow signal the renaissance of French journalism. Thanks, Tark. It took a while, but exactly one year ago, the Me Too movement finally came to the forefront in Greece. Since then, issues faced by women from sexual harassment to domestic violence have been making headlines, including the ultimate form of gender violence, femicide, the intentional killing of women simply because they're women, most often at the hands of current or ex-partners. In 2021, Greece reported 18 cases of femicide, a 50% rise over 2020. Greece is one of Europe's most patriarchal societies. It ranks dead last in the EU's gender equality index, and that is reflected in the country's news media which has placed the mainstream media's coverage of these stories under the microscope. The Listening Post's Flo Phillips now on femicide in Greece and the sometimes detrimental role that journalism has played there in the way such crimes are seen. First came the pictures, a family in mourning. Then came the words spoken by the widowed husband. <laughs> A funeral tribute from a young father to his murdered wife as he held their baby. The baby's mother was a woman named Caroline Crouch, and as the story went, she was beaten and strangled to death in her Athens home by a gang of ruthless foreign robbers. It was a crime story made for television, with elements of glamour and gore, almost too scripted to be believed. And the Greek media feasted on it. 
ικανοποιούσε όλα τα στερεότυπα της ελληνικής κοινωνίας. It satisfied all of Greek society's stereotypes. A beautiful family, the breadwinner, Bob is a handsome, successful pilot, and his wife, Caroline. Και ζούσαν ένα μεγάλο έρωτα. Ο γάμος τους έγινε σε θέρετρο της Πορτογαλίας. Που έμενε σε ένα... They lived in a beautiful masonette where they were bringing up their beautiful baby daughter. That would be enough to fulfill all societal norms of what a family should look like. But then, this perfect family is under attack by who? By armed foreign burglars. The Greek media turned that material into juicy content and the viewers into collective mourners. Then everything came crashing down. It took 37 days for the real story to come out. The revelation that Crouch was in fact murdered by her own husband left Greeks reeling. And yet the mainstream media, they weren't ready to let go of their narrative. The coverage of the facts was problematic. There was a reporter on Sky TV who, after Babis had confessed to the murder, still referred to him as the alleged suspect. She stated that at least he didn't cut her up. It was almost like he was giving the suspect an alibi instead of calling him out for this heinous crime. That happened because Babis was the son-in-law that everyone in Greek society wanted to have. It's just that he turned out to be a murderer. The more conservative wing of the Greek media were eager to justify his actions. Suddenly, Caroline was depicted as a foreign woman, way too dynamic and vocal. And according to a TV psychologist, Babis was the one who had the ideal online profile that would get him many followers. Gender determines how the media research and report on a story, and it ends up being entirely confusing. It feels like mainstream media here often focused more on the woman, forgetting the actual criminal. The victim was pretty, she was a kind person, a young mother. Greek television usually chooses to stick to journalistic clichés. And by choosing not to refer to these killings as femicides, we end up with coverage that murders the victim for a second time. The impact of femicide goes beyond the loss of life. These are crimes that tap into a collective fear, so how the media treat them really matters. Unfortunately, for many years now, the Greek media haven't helped to bring about a zero-tolerance culture for gender violence. Just the opposite. Like sound bites that are sympathetic to the murderer, coming from the police department. Stavros Balaskas is a senior officer on the Caroline Crouch case. That soundbite came to be known as the Balaskas Doctrine, advice delivered on camera on how to escape true justice, a life sentence, if you murder your wife. Just call the police and confess right away. There was no follow-up from the journalist, no pushback. Was it any coincidence then that, in the weeks after, more men came forward confessing to killing their partners. Here is yet another example of us journalists being caught by surprise. We weren't aware of the incredible social impact this statement would have, and we should have emphasized how important it was to address it. The journalist never questioned the statement or even triggered a dialogue around it. The murder of Caroline Crouch should not be seen in isolation. Feminist groups estimate that over the past 10 years, gender-based violence has tripled in Greece. And currently, at least one woman dies at the hands of a man, most often her partner or ex-partner, every month. 
Like Garafalia Saraco, pushed off the Folegandros cliffs by her boyfriend, Nectaria Maraki stabbed 16 times by her estranged husband, Odora Zaharia, gunned down by her former partner on the island of Rothos. But tune in to any of Greece's many popular TV shows and you'd be left guessing as to who the real victims are. In the case of Thora, the suspect's uncle got a lot of airtime to enhance the killer's profile. The truth is, the Greek media reflect the gender inequality that exists in society at large, and they always emphasize the fact that the suspect has never been in trouble with the authorities. The uncle was publicly expressing the other side of the story. He came on my show and blamed the woman, saying that her morals were questionable. You know, it's a relief for those of us who present shows like mine to be able to show viewers both sides of the argument, no matter how difficult it is for us as journalists. Because a coin always has two sides. The accused lives his own truth. Zina Kutsilini doesn't mince her words. She's a host for Star Channel and one of the country's most famous faces. For more than three decades, she has been part of the Greek media establishment in a country where entrenched patriarchal views have been slow to change. I believe that if all women unite and support each other, men will follow. To some extent, we are to blame for this current situation. When I present femicide on my show, do you know what I observe? I observe that if the blame is placed on the woman, women stop watching while men continue. Women don't have the strength of character to face their own truths. It's very important to be able to look yourself in the eye and tell yourself, it's your fault that you are putting up with your husband. Please, let's not blame everything on the patriarchy. When we talk about patriarchy, sexism, or toxic masculinity in Greece, there's always this strange reaction. Sometimes it's laughter, but some women get abused for bringing these issues up, and they're never mentioned on Greek television. I actually don't think I've heard the word patriarchy used on Greek TV in years. Yeah. As it happens, the word patriarchy comes from Greek, patriarchia. It means rule of the father, and covering women, the violence they suffer, remains a challenge for Greek news organizations with their culture of male dominance to this day. And finally, Novak Djokovic, the tennis player who's been causing such a COVID commotion. Djokovic showed up in Melbourne, unvaccinated, to defend his Australian Open title. He had a vaccine exemption certificate, then had that exemption taken away. He had a visa and then did not, due to his dodgy paperwork and an ever-changing story on whether he had tested positive and when. Not a fun week for the number one seed. Now, imagine spending nine years in that kind of limbo. Mehdi Ali is a 24-year-old Iranian who's cooped up at the same Melbourne hotel Djokovic was. He's among the more than 1,400 refugees and migrants currently stuck in Australian detention. Ali's been tweeting, giving interviews to get those stories to news organizations that seem far more interested in celebrities like Djokovic than the larger issue, an immigration system that's broken and needs fixing. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. We're joined by Mehdi Ali, an Iranian refugee who's been held in detention by Australian authorities for nine years. I like speaking out because I feel I'm protesting against the cruelty and against the unjust treatments of uh, Australian authority. And it's kind of sad that after nine years, because Djokovic has been detained here, and all these cameras around and uh, people trying to get in touch and especially journalists trying to get in touch. I'm glad that the media eventually paying attention about our circumstances and our situation because we've been through misery. Mehdi, what do you make of all the media attention? 
Well, yesterday a few people like uh, messaged me over Facebook and uh, Twitter, and they came here for uh, Djokovic. Then they found out about uh, our circumstances, and they were shocked. I hope they drag they drag the attention further, and they keep they keep talking about it. They, they keep the attention on about our situation. I really hope I don't want it to be a wave, you know, comes and goes.